Welcome back. This is the third lecture of E340-542, Network Dynamics. Today, we're going to finish up our general discussion of network types, and then we're going to move on to talk about chemical reactions a little bit. And it, a lot of the material will be quite elementary, but I think it's worth getting the basics to make sure everybody's comfortable with it. And again, uh, if I'm going too slowly, feel free to say so. If I'm going too fast and you want to review something, uh, here at home I have a drawing tablet so we can put up a whiteboard and, and talk through the whiteboard as well. As always, I need to remind people that this lecture is live streamed and recorded uh, on YouTube. I have a lot of slides today. I don't think we're going to get through all of it. Uh, but I don't know exactly how far we'll get, so we'll see. It depends a little bit on uh, how much uh, people were able to do of the homework material before class. Basically, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about pharmacokinetic models, which are very important and interesting, but this class is not going to have time to do a lot of. And then we're going to get into the basics of chemical reactions. We talked a little bit about that on the first uh, week. Uh, and then we'll come back to actually implementing things in tellurium and antimony, review some of the features of tellurium and antimony, and uh, talk about stoichiometry, a little bit on kinetics and kinetics laws. Uh, Herbert has quite a bit on this. We're going to do a little bit less than that. Uh, if people are interested, there are plenty of online materials about that. And uh, depending on how far we get, we may review some of the homework that was due today. At the end of this slide deck, there is an appendix which derives uh, mass action kinetics uh, based on the textbook, a biophysics textbook. Uh, it's, it's too mathematical to be presenting in, in this class, but uh, if people are interested, it's there. I wanted to make a few comments on the homework. Um, I appreciate people doing the homework always. People came up with some interesting uh, comparison texts, and people had some variable responses to Herbert's textbook, which was nice for problem one. These aim of those kind of exercises isn't for people to write uh, long essays. The goal is to have you uh, pay enough attention that you can understand, pay attention to what, what's going on in the textbook. Uh, the second problem, which was write down a network and describe it, uh, surprised me a little bit. Um, people had some really interesting ideas about things to model, uh, but the majority of people didn't come up with dynamic network models. Uh, a lot of people uh, either came up with static networks, so uh, which is fine. Uh, the problem was pretty open-ended. Or agent-based models. So, for example, somebody proposed uh, an ecological system model where you had predators and prey. Now, that's a classic network model. But in the classic network model, you have a population where you have foxes and you have the number of foxes, and then you have prey, the number of rabbits. And the number of rabbits that get eaten is some function of the number of foxes and the number of rabbits. But you don't actually have the individual foxes and rabbits as agents. And it's sometimes a little bit tricky to think about how to simplify a problem uh, from the agent-based situation uh, to the uh, network model situation. And you might say, well, why, why bother to do that? Why not just use the agent-based models? And the answer is very often that the agent-based models are more informative, but they're also a lot more complicated. They have a lot more parameters. Uh, they are much more complicated to write. Uh, they're much slower to run computationally. Uh, and so if the simplified uh, network model works, uh, you can do a lot more with it. You can run much more replicates. You can uh, explore parameter sensitivities more easily. And so uh, there's a role for both the agent-based approaches and the network approaches. As I say, in the spring, I teach 
agent-based modeling. And so I think that that's something that, that was interesting to me, seeing what people came up with. Uh, now, this week, I added that little problem about identifying a, a network online and talking about it. And so that's an opportunity to revisit that, starting with something that really is a network model. And so I hope people will think a little bit about the difference, perhaps, between what you proposed in that problem, too, from the first homework and what was asked for in the last problem this week. Problem three was reading and discussing that student written uh, 10 simple rules of modeling paper. Uh, as people pointed out, um, the key value in that paper was to focus on the fact that it's very important to define your aims in your models carefully. And that you need to build multiple models with multiple levels of detail. I don't agree with everything in that paper. Um, as somebody said, it's almost orthogonal to the approach Herbert takes. But I think uh, modeling is such a, a sophisticated and tricky thing to do that having a variety of different points of view is, is valuable. So I hope reading that paper was useful to people. I keep trying to write a paper myself, which would express my point of view. There's a draft, which somehow never gets finished. Uh, but uh, it's something that I think is is uh, interesting to think about. Um, for problem four, I didn't ask people in this week, that first week, to submit code. Uh, in general, I do ask you to submit your code and results when you have uh, homework problems which have computation in it. Uh, but if people did submit that homework problem, uh, I gave people some extra credit. But if going forward, please remember to submit your code uh, and your uh, and your results. So I think I may have mentioned this, but if not, uh, there is an online resource by Mike Elovitz at Caltech, uh, which is an online textbook called Biological Circuit Design. Uh, there's a link, biocircuits.github.io. And I would say that this textbook is a little bit more mathematical than what we're going to be doing. Uh, it covers a lot of the same ground as Herbert's text. Um, it has uh, a number of nice uh, motifs and their analysis, which are missing in Herbert's textbook. Herbert doesn't have as many motifs. And so I think it could be quite interesting, perhaps, to select uh, some of the motifs that uh, Elowitz presents uh, and study them together. Um, we could take one of these, for example, in a later class, we could take one of these examples or two of these examples and recode it in Andamonium Tellurium. Elevitz hard codes everything. Uh, so he doesn't uh, follow principle of shareability. Uh, he puts everything in Colab, Jupyter Notebooks Colab, which I think is a great idea and maybe more modern than using, uh, using um, a nano hub deployment, a little bit easier to do as well. Uh, so I definitely encourage you to uh, look at this textbook. Uh, they're great. Uh, some of it's not there. There are some sections where he says this will come soon. So it's typical in development. Uh, but there's some great things in this. Uh, and uh, again, it's rather a different point of view. Some of the material is quite the similar, but some of it has a different point of view. And depending on your background and interests, you may find that this is uh, easier to understand or maybe not so useful. Uh, but uh, I, I definitely uh, think that it's worth exploring. Uh, he's certainly a great, a great teacher and a great scientist who's worked in this area quite a bit. And so uh, the uh, incoherent feedforward loops, as an example, that's something we would do in class, probably uh, adaptation. That adaptation example is one that I would have been wanting to add to the class for a long time. It's very pretty, number six. Um, amplification, kinetic proofreading. Kinetic proofreading is a beautiful uh, biophysical question. Um, and that's actually an example that uh, some students have done as a class project over the years, if they were more biophysical. It's a very elegant, uh, a very elegant way that uh, uh, 
DNA and RNA copying is corrected. And then uh, in the case of uh, Elowitz course, it also goes into some spatial things that we wouldn't do in this class. It would be more like what we do next semester. So the Turing patterns or the reaction diffusion patterns are more things that we would do in, in the second semester. But I think it's worth uh, taking a look at that and uh, seeing what you think. So just to quickly review, we started out last time, one of the key concepts we looked at was the central dogma of biology, DNA to RNA to protein. Uh, thought about what that meant in terms of time scales. And we talked about uh, some of the main network classes, uh, metabolic or chemical reaction networks uh, that typically describe the rate of production of components in the cell. Uh, protein signaling networks, which really are the thing we're going to focus on the most in this class, and how to interpret them, uh, because the notation uh, for protein signaling networks doesn't really correspond to chemical reactions uh, very well, so we have to understand how to interpret those to write them as chemical reactions. And we talked a little bit about some basic motifs. Uh, formation of complexes, which is very important in signaling and gene regulation, uh, phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, which are one of the primary ways that uh, the functional activity of uh, enzymes is turned on and off. And uh, in this case, also active degradation, uh, which we're going to get back to a little bit later today. We talked very briefly about gene regulatory networks. Uh, once we start with the fundamental dogma of biology, uh, then we have to think about how to represent gene regulation. The continuum mechanics, the continuum rate laws that we write uh, for chemical reactions are a little bit funny to use in the context of gene regulation because transcription is usually either on or off. It's Boolean. However, the translation of RNA into protein is definitely graded. And so what you have is that because gene regulation is fairly, a gene transcription and translation is fairly slow, you have, uh, you have a uh, low pass filter that effectively takes the fact that the genes are transcribed or not transcribed, integrates that over time and gives you a, a continuously variable rate of uh, protein production. The key here again is that you'll typically see something like the bottom left hand side here, which just says P1 activates P2. That is, more P1 gives you more P2 or higher rate of production of P2. Uh, if P1 is a transcription factor or promoter, then uh, it, you can draw the gene and you saw something like this where P1 binds to a activation site or initiation site. Uh, and then you see the production of messenger RNA, and then somehow magically that turns into the protein. Uh, one thing you always have to remember interpreting this kind of diagram is that there's decay, and we'll talk about understanding decay a little bit later uh, today. But the diagram here on the on the left, P1 promotes production of P2, actually turns into a chemical reaction diagram that looks like what we have on the right, which is that nothing is producing P2 because we don't know where the components come from to make that protein. We don't take account for them. And then P2 decays. And the rate of production of P2 depends on the amount of P1. That's what we mean by being activated. And the rate of decay depends only on the amount of P2. There are a lot of motifs. Elowitz talks about quite a few of them. Although, again, most of the motifs that he lists there in his uh, textbook are signaling motifs more than regulatory motifs. Uh, but one of the things that he does talk about in some detail is multiple control when you have multiple signals affecting the same gene and the difficulty of coming up with ways of describing that. Uh, gene cascades, where gene one turns on gene two, gene two turns on gene three, gene three turns on gene four. Or in the case here, gene one turns on gene two, uh, 
with its first arrow, and then gene two turns off gene three. Uh, it's also a possibility. Uh, Autoregulation, which is surprisingly common. Here, the production of a gene inhibits its own production, uh, which is a way of regulating the amount uh, uh, of a gene, the concentration of a gene product, a very common motif. And then the role of additional molecules, cofactors, uh, or phosphorylation uh, in regulation of gene transcription. Something we didn't talk about, and again, it's a, it's a, it's actually probably from a, from a engineering and, and biomedical perspective, the place where this kind of modeling is used the most. Uh, I hope Jim Sluka will come and give his usual lecture for the class on how to do PBPK modeling. But PBPK modeling is not talking about molecules per se. It's fundamentally talking about transport in the blood. And PBPK modeling in particular has a model of the cardiovascular system. Uh, you have the heart uh, and its chambers. Of course, if you're not a mammal, you might only have one, two chambers in the heart instead of four. Uh, so it could be different. Uh, you have the lungs uh, here. You have the liver, the kidneys, the other organ systems, uh, and you have flow. And so here you're transporting a chemical species uh, throughout the body. And depending on the level of detail you're interested in, uh, you could imagine modeling, say, the liver or the heart as just one box. You have something coming in, something going out. Or you could actually look at the flow in more detail, for example, here within the liver lobule. Depending on what you're doing, that level of detail will be different. Uh, and this kind of modeling is used enormously frequently uh, in the pharmaceutical industry and also in the toxicological industry uh, to try to understand what's called ADME, absorption, dosimetry, uh, uh, metabolism, and elimination. So how, how, how is a chemical taken up by the body? Where does it go in the body? What's produced by it? And how has it gotten rid of? Uh, the classic PBPK model uh, has, as I mentioned, a very simplified uh, box diagram where you have uh, a box that says brain, a box that says kidney, a box that says heart, a box that says muscle, here a box that says fat, other tissues, lung, and you have the flow modeled. And what you want to know is uh, how what the volume of each organ is, what the flow of blood in and out of that organ is, um, if the chemical uh, is leaving the blood into the tissue, you want to know how that works. And the key thing here, again, is typically to get a concentration profile of the chemical versus time uh, in, the, in the particular organ system of interest. And that can be pretty important. For example, if you have a chemotherapeutic that's quite toxic, you'd like it to go into the tumor and you would like it to go in as little as possible to organs that are very vulnerable. You don't want to be damaging the heart or the kidneys that don't regenerate. Uh, typically, the liver is the other place that tends to get clobbered uh, by uh, molecules in the blood because the liver is the primary place that eliminates uh, chemicals from the blood. And so the kinds of questions that you're asking is what are the concentrations of molecules, particular organ or the blood? Um, you might very well, if you're doing pharmaco, uh, ask how does the concentration vary depending on the weight of the individual, the age of the individual. Uh, people of different ages have different metabolism in their livers, for example. Uh, there are sex-based differences in metabolism and availability of chemicals. Um, what if you have cardiovascular disease or what if you're diabetic? Uh, these can change these things quite dramatically. And so uh, if you want to understand how a drug's going to work in the population, it's pretty important to be able to understand this variability. And there are commercial packages like SimSip that have models of all sorts of different representative individuals 
uh, different ages, different races, genders, uh, etc. Trying to understand if you're a drug company, drug development company, how to do dosing, what you have to watch out for. Uh, you also have to ask questions. For example, uh, we like taking pills. Uh, it's much easier than having an injection. Uh, but the availability is slower and more variable than it would be with an injection. Sometimes the, the drug is completely broken down in the stomach or the gut. Um, and you like to know how fast the drug is eliminated. Sometimes you want it to come in and get gotten rid of very quickly. Other times you want the drug level to be relatively constant for a long time. So you'd like to be able to design that. And so, uh, these are kinds of questions that are very uh, fundamental. The active molecular species may be one thing, but how that molecular species is packaged and delivered has a very different result uh, in terms of therapeutic efficacy and the damage that the, that molecule causes to the body. In this case, again, the nodes represent organs or portions of organs. Uh, the node states are the amounts of molecule uh, usually not concentrations in this case. Um, there are boundary nodes that represent, for example, the gut uh, and the available chemical in the gut, although there are also models like this that have the gut broken down into a bunch of compartments. Uh, and then there's elimination primarily through the kidneys and the liver through the feces. And the links here primarily represent transport uh, through the blood, the flow of blood. Uh, but it also uh, will include metabolism for elimination. Sometimes it goes the other way too. For example, the liver will uh, create metabolites that are then put back into the gut and then reabsorbed uh, or into the blood. And actually, the the the, the liver uh, does some rather complicated things because uh, chemicals are broken down partly in the bile. Uh, they're then put back into the gut through the gallbladder uh, and then reabsorbed. And that cycling of chemicals is actually pretty important uh, to our functionality. So if you have to have a gallbladder removed, it changes the way you metabolize drugs a lot. I'm not going to go into the mathematics there uh, in detail. Uh, there's a question here. about time delays uh typically the, there's a question in the chat let's say species a is in skin and a star is the same species in the liver to model transport from skin to liver can i use time delays um, or do you use other methods well there certainly are delays um, typically though you assume that the the, the uh, compartments are near each other or that the blood circulates rapidly uh, so blood flow is quite fast. Um, circulation time of blood in the body is quite fast compared to absorption times. And so typically we don't include a lot of delay there. In the gut, you definitely have some delays, uh, but you typically do uh, ODE passing from one compartment to the other without delays. Again, there's a simple technical reason for that, which is that delay equations are mathematically ill-posed. Uh, they can be solved numerically in certain cases. Uh, but um, the moment you write a formal delay equation, uh, you lose your ability to do almost everything mathematically that you'd like to do. And so people go to a lot of effort to try to avoid using delay equations. There definitely are cases where you use them. Gene regulatory networks, where there is no protein produced for 20 minutes after you start transcription. Uh, are classic places where delays make sense, uh, but typically we try to we try to avoid those. Uh, let's. I'm not going to do this exercise today. I would like to, uh, but I'm going to leave that to you as a little bit of a thought problem, homework problem, uh, looking into PBK PBPK models. They tend to always have very similar structure because the organs and their connections are the same. And so the basic PPPK architecture is the same. There is one. Uh, what differs is whether you break up those, say, the box that says heart into subcompartments, or 
if you're doing the brain, whether you model the blood-brain barrier in particular detail. Um, but the basic, the basic network model was defined, I think, more than 50, 55 years ago, and it's been refined and used continuously from that time forward. As I mentioned, uh, almost all biological problems, complex biological problems, uh, have multiple network types uh, interacting with each other. You certainly have chemical transformations like metabolic networks. Uh, you almost always have activation inhibition like signaling networks. Uh, many things will change gene activity. So you'll have gene regulatory networks. And very often you'll also have transport. Molecules have to be moved from one place to another like PVPK. Uh, and so uh, in, in reality, uh, biological function even within a single cell involves aspects of all of these kinds of model. This is a picture. You can't probably see it in detail, but if you were to zoom in on this, it talks about um, cell death through apoptosis, uh, proliferation of cells, uh, and some of the signals that give rise to that. So those are what I wanted to left over from last week. And now I want to come back to uh, chemical reactions. So this is really chapter two in Appendix D. Um, if you want to look at that great Phillips textbook, Physical Biology of the Cell, for the mathematical details and the justification for this, you don't need to have the mathematics or the justifications. Um, the derivations are reasonably complex, and uh, you don't learn, I think, a huge amount from going through those derivations. Um, but uh, I used to teach them. So I have no problem with doing it. It's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's a, it's quite a bit of mathematics for, in the end, a rather simple result. But chapter six and fifteen, and in uh, Phillips, talk about this, and the appendix uh, for the slide deck comes from that section. So we're going again coming back. We talked about this already last week and the week before. Uh, chemical reactions. We're going to have a concept of a molecular species A that's transformed into molecular species B. Uh, and there's going to be a rate of transformation V forward. And so that's our basic concept. And uh, when we're talking about chemical reactions, we might want to know what the long time concentrations of the reactants are, how fast the concentrations change under particular conditions. Uh, how the long time concentrations or rate of change depend on the concentrations and parameters. And that means we have to convert these arrow diagrams, these chemical reaction diagrams, into mathematics so that we can analyze and answer those questions. So let's start out with a very simple example, which I showed already two weeks ago. Uh, we have two molecules of adenosine diphosphate uh, ADP, and that's going to be converted into adenosine triphosphate plus adenosine monophosphate. But it's one of the phosphates gets moved from one of the ADPs to one of the other one. Uh, so one is phosphorylated and one is dephosphorylated. Uh, you could go either way. Uh, this, well, this reaction could run both directions. So this introduces the first concept, which is reversibility. So I'll try to be careful about this. If the arrow points in one direction, we are going to assume that the, arrow, the, that the reaction is irreversible. That is, only one uh, direction of reaction occurs. Uh, I should point out that there are a lot of people who are sloppy about this and who use a forward arrow to mean both forward and backward reactions. And so you have to be aware that that's a potential problem when you're interpreting a paper. Uh, well, I'll use a double arrow, like the one below, uh, when there is the back reaction as well as the forward reaction. In reality, in chemistry, there's always some level of back reaction, even if it's very slow. But we often, the forward rate is so much bigger than the backward rate that we neglect the backward rate. I'll always try to label uh, the forward and backward rates because they're fundamentally different uh, uh, with a V forward and V reverse. 
a positive net rate, that is VF minus VR, positive net rate means mass flows from left to right. A negative net rate, VF minus VR less than zero, means mass flows from right to left. We've talked about the word stoichiometry. Stoichiometry has two slightly different meanings. One of, simple, one of them simply means, uh, you say a reaction is stoichiometric if it's mass conserving. Um, in general, uh, chemical reaction diagrams tend to be mass conserving. Uh, signaling network models and gene regulatory models are not mass conserving. When we're saying that a, a protein is synthesized, we don't model all of the components of the protein being assembled together. We assume that the ribosomes have a supply of source material uh, and that they don't worry about it. And so most of the time, the things we're going to do in this class are not going to be mass conserving. Let's just think about that for a minute. Um, there's a tiny exercise. Um, Maybe just take a minute or two, think about these examples, which of these are mass conserving and which aren't. Uh, maybe somebody could just, instead of look and look at it and think about it for a minute, but maybe somebody can just raise a hand or unmute and answer the questions and go around the room. So I, I unmuted. I don't know if you can hear me. Sure, Elmer, go ahead. Yeah, so chemical reaction is mass conserving. Yeah. I'd say, and um, should I go on or should somebody else? Well, so, um, another one, that's okay. So when we, I know chain regulatory is not mass conserving, but I this is not chain regulatory, this is a substrate one to substrate two. So it's an activation, so it's not mass conserving an activation usually. Am I wrong? I don't know. So does anybody else have an opinion on number two? Number two is a sort of a biological question. So if you're not familiar with phosphorylation and what it means, I wouldn't expect somebody to answer that. If you've done biochemistry or biology, then that one will be maybe more meaningful. Um, it says explicitly that... Um, so then it's much conserving because you have phosphors that activates... Well, so here we say that S1 is becoming S2, where S2 is phosphorylated. That means that there's a phosphate group being attached to S1 to make S2. And we don't have S1 plus phosphate going to S2. So it's not a mass conserving reaction as written. Uh, often you'll see um, the a slightly different way of representing that uh, I think I showed yet last week, um, there was a diagram of some some uh, signaling networks. Probably, again, the, the, the diagram was a little bit too condensed to be able to see. But it, it showed the, the phosphate transfers explicitly. Very often, the phosphate transfers are not, are not kept track of in terms of mass conservation. Sometimes that's okay. Sometimes it actually causes problems if you don't keep track of it. Anybody else? How about number three, decay process? A goes to nothing. William, is that mass conserving? I don't think so. Yeah, definitely not. I mean, if, if we're not keeping track of where the mass went, it's definitely not mass conserving. That's good. Uh, uh, number four is a bit of a trick. Uh, P53, the activation of the form of P53, promotes cell death. I'm not exactly sure how we would even come up with a mass-conserving version of that. Uh, so when we talk about uh, a, a chemical species regulating a, a behavior, it becomes sort of difficult to, to come up with mass conserving forms, unlike the phosphorylation example where we could do that. Um, contribution of glucose to cell growth. How about that one? Pedro says no, right? Uh, that one is, again, rather interesting. There, there's a, some very nice uh, section 
in uh, in the first chapter, second chapter of that Phillips textbook, where they actually count for each molecule of glucose that the cell takes up, how much of it goes into energy production, how much of it goes into synthesis of various components of the cell, how many glucose molecules are needed to produce particular things in the cell. And so there actually are metabolic models that try to do uh, mass conservation uh, for the whole metabolic cycle. And flux balance methods do that. Flux balances intrinsically at mass conservation. Pedro asked, do they even work? The answer is sometimes they do, um, but they're not easy to get to work. It's a lot of work to make that happen. But it's fascinating to see people be able to do that. And then number six, if I say I have an activator and then I produce a gene product, uh, well, that's clearly not mass conserving because I don't keep track of where the messenger RNA material comes from. I don't keep track of where the protein comes from either. So those are some things to think about. Uh, so there's some examples. So we've already talked our way through. All right. So um, if I wanted to make a mass conserving version of this phosphorylation diagram, what would I do? Maybe people could just write on a piece of paper uh, what they think that might look like. And I already told you a little bit about what, what it would have to look like. Again, uh, if you don't remember what phosphorylation means, phosphorylation means the addition of a phosphate group to the molecule. And so fundamentally, you need a little diagram that shows where the phosphate comes from and how it gets transferred from S1 to S2. That's right. Uh, Pedro puts in the, in the chat, S1 plus A goes to S1A plus residues, yes. So you have a, a phosphorylated enzyme that interacts with S1, and the phosphate is transferred from the enzyme to S1. And that's classical kinase. Uh, so exactly what Pedro said. Um, a star is often used uh, to indicate phosphorylation uh, in chemistry and biochemistry. This can be a bit confusing because a star is also used to indicate uh, uh, steady states and fixed points in mathematics. And so we have to get used to the fact that the same symbol can mean different things in different contexts. Unfortunately, the same symbol can mean different things in the same context, depending on whether you're a mathematician or a chemist or a biologist. Uh, but yes, here, S1 plus ATP goes to S1 star plus ADP. One of the phosphates is transferred from adenosine triphosphate, and that uh, dephosphorylates the adenosine triphosphate. So that would be an example of a mass conserving reaction. And that, that's one where the back reaction happens a lot. And so you'll often get loops where you'll have phosphorylation and dephosphorylation as a loop. Okay, so now let's uh, sim uh, simulate, uh, maybe we, we, or we already did this in a sense on uh, two weeks ago, but let's come back. Let's just simulate the simplest possible reactions, which would be constant production that is constant rate of production of chemical species A. And you'll notice what is interesting, what is not the same about an input arrow and an output arrow? And this came up actually over the weekend. Elmer asked a question uh, to me on, by chat or by email about one of the homework problems. And this is something that is fundamentally uh, we'll come back to in more detail in a little bit, but it's a fundamental thing to be aware of uh, when we're thinking about chemical reactions, uh, which is that we can have a, a source reaction which has a rate that's independent of concentration. But if we had a decay reaction that was V equals K, why would that not make sense? Why would a decay reaction that was just a constant not make sense? Uh, 
Anybody, Ibrahim? Because it has to work on the on on the substrate. It has to oh. work on something. It's right. I mean there is some B around, but or maybe not. Well, so what happens if there's no B? Then there's no production to the right side. Right, but if the decay, if we have decay, that's a constant rate. Then even if we have no Zero. B, we'll get a negative amount of B. And so we can't have destruction of a chemical that's not proportional to the concentration. If we do that, we'll get negative concentrations, which don't happen. We can pour chemical in at any rate we like, but we can't take out something that's not there. And so that's a sort of a fundamental little thought. All right. All right. So now let's just write a little bit of ODE. Uh, we have nothing goes to A at a constant rate. That immediately can be transferred to an ordinary differential equation. Uh, an arrow means dA by dt. An arrow pointing to a chemical means dA by dt equals whatever is sitting on top of the arrow. It's purely mechanical. We don't have to think. We just write it. And so if uh, V is equal to K, pointing at A, that is exactly equivalent to dA by dt equals K. And we know the solution to that ODE. That's just A of T is the initial amount of A, whatever it was. That's sometimes written A sub zero, sometimes A of zero, sometimes A is superscript zero, different notations for initial values, uh, plus K times T, just a linearly increasing amount of A. For decay, same thing. B goes to nothing. Again, we write dB by dt, but if the arrow is pointing away, we have a minus sign. So dB by dt is equal to minus k times b. This is one of the other very few ordinary differential equations where you just need to remember that that's an exponential. And so in this case, b of t is equal to the initial value of b, e to the minus kt. Important thing here is that k now defines the time scale for decay of the chemical species. If K is large, the lifetime of the chemical is short. It has units of per time. So one over K is the lifetime of the species. Okay. Neither of those, well, the second one, I guess, has a steady state of zero. Uh, but let's come up with a, with a definition of a steady state. If we have, this is now mathematics, uh, if we have a set of species, A, B, C, D, and so on, a given species, A, is in steady state when its time derivative is zero. The system as a whole is in steady state when the time derivative of all of the species is zero. That doesn't, necessarily, doesn't mean that there is an interconversion of species, but it does mean that if they're forward and backward reactions, they balance. And a lot of the homework was talking about uh, finding steady states. There's a bit of a subtle difference between a steady state and an equilibrium, chemical equilibrium. And we'll come to that in a minute. Now we're going to look at the, the simplest, and this was in the homework, uh, the simplest uh, chemical reaction that has a meaningful steady state. Uh, we have nothing going to A at a rate K1, and A decaying to nothing at a rate K2 times A. So the question is first, what is the ODE corresponding to this reaction? How many parameters are there to specify this reaction? And what's the steady state concentration of A, which we call A star? And if you want to be a little bit more adventurous, what's the shape of A? Uh, and how does it depend on K1 and K2? And A of T at time zero. And if you if you if you look ahead, um, 
number four answers number two. So in the sense that it's, it's short circuiting the, the problem. And then what is the analytical solution for this? Did people do this in the homework already or do people want to take a few minutes and try it together? Why don't people just take a, three minutes to do this? Out? This one is, is in a sense not so exciting, uh, but everything else that we do will be a generalization of what you're doing here. If you have a lot of reactions and the and the rate laws are pretty complicated, then then solving these things can get a little bit algebraically complicated. Uh, but fundamentally, you're not doing very much more than this. Well, if you have multiple reactions, then you're diagonalizing matrices. You're solving eigenvectors and eigenvalues to get the to get the steady states. So it's a little bit more. You have to do a little bit of uh, linear algebra. Um, I would think it'd be K1 times T plus some initial concentration minus another constant times E to the negative KT. Okay. So that's trying to get the, the actually solving the equation analytically. So does anybody have a simple version of the ODE? What would the ODE look like? William, go ahead. Um, wouldn't it just be... K or DA over DT equals K1 minus K2A. That's right. It's very mechanical. Don't have to work very hard. And so how many parameters are there? Well, there's K1, K2, and the initial value of A. That's all you've got. Three. Now the steady state concentration, how do you get the steady state? You set that derivative to zero. That would be K1 equals K2 times A star or a star is equal to k1 divided by k2. That makes sense. The, the faster you put the chemical in, the more you're going to have. The faster it decays, the less you're going to have. And so that's basically the result. Here we go. k1 minus k2a. We set the steady state. We set this to zero on the left. We solve for a star. We just get K1 over K2. And what's the if we actually wrote this as a simulation, what we find is exactly what you said, that the concentration decays exponentially from whatever its initial value is to the equilibrium value. But sorry, the steady state value should be careful. It's not the equilibrium value, it's steady state value. There is no equilibrium value. Now, here I started out with more chemical. If I started out with less, these would increase exponentially to that steady state value. And here's what I've done with that simulation there. And there was a little homework problem in the home, first homework, which was actually to do this little bit of parameter scan. That was in the very first homework to try to do that. And we could play with that here. I think for the moment, we'll keep going. Uh, but we can we can do these things together in in a minute. Okay. So now let's uh, think about how to write this uh, simulation. So why don't we actually do this uh, together? Why don't we have everybody fire up uh, tellurium antimony and write this? chemical reaction. Do people remember enough antimony to do that, to uh, to go forward? I'm, I'm using the NanoHub antimony, but you're welcome to use the, uh, welcome to use the uh, desktop version. And the uh, examples are all in the student materials if you, if you can't remember how to do it. So what do we have to do? Do people remember what we have to do to, uh, to write uh, a simulation. William, go ahead. Um, you first import Tellurium as TE and then um, set a variable, anything like R or whatever, um, equal to TE and then you load, 
load A, which I don't know what that stands for. Um, and then you sort of just do your triple quotes and write out the reaction verbatim and the and the reaction rate and the initial um, your initial values of A, K1, K2, B, whatever it is, and then um, simulate it and plot it. Okay. Why don't people try that? I'll type myself, see if I can get it to work. But why don't everybody try to review what they did we last time? You can look at the manual. Uh, this this example is in is in the is basically the first example in the manual online manual Herbert's online manual. If you don't remember how to do it. So what am I doing here? I'm just typing. Again, I think it's better for you to try it on your own, but I'm just typing my arrows. Nothing goes to A at a rate K1. A goes to nothing at a rate K2 times A. And I have to define some initial concentration of A, a value for the K1, a value for K2, and that's all I have to do. And then I have to do I have to load my model. Using the TE load A. And then I have to simulate it. And then probably I'd like to display it. Something like that. So let's see what happens if we run that. Oops. Okay. Nothing magic there. Why is it printing out the, the array? Because I didn't put it into something. Result equals that. I won't, no, no, no. Then it won't display it. Okay. Why don't I give everybody a little bit of time to get that working for you? It's better to get that running for people. If you need help, please reach out. Notice that I clearly haven't reached an equilibrium in the simulation that I just ran. If I ask the question, what's the time scale for equilibration? Remember, that's 1 over um, K2. K2 is 0.1, so it takes at least 10 time units. So maybe if I make K2 a little bit bigger, things will happen faster. There we go. How are people doing? Does everybody have this running or is that is, do you need more time? Ibrahim says it's okay. Give me a thumbs up when you're ready. I'll wait. No problem. Alex says it's okay. Okay. Well, uh, John, if you 
if you want to run Tellurium online, you don't need to run it. You don't need to have it loaded to your computer. So you can run it in in uh, in um, in um, NanoHub. So if you if you go to NanoHub org and then you search for tellurium resources then you'll be able to run it online so i don't have here what i'm showing on the screen i'm not running it on my computer i'm running it on a server that way you don't have to worry about loading it particular version of Python or particular library, everything is online. Pedro, maybe you could share in the chat the link to the uh, NanoHub Tellurium for John. That's okay. I can pull it up as well. Now the first time the first time uh, you go to NanoHub online, you'll have to create an account, but you can log in through Indiana University. If you're an IU student or employee, uh, it'll give you an option to 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 log in through I through a university. Type Indiana University. It'll it'll let you log in using your your IU credentials. As I say, if I were going to do that, if I were going to start out this year, I probably would use Colab and do it all in Colab. But we've been NanoHub is was, was it was around long before Colab, and so we we've been using NanoHub as our as our resource. Okay, if you've got this working, I would suggest uh, changing the values of K1 and K2, and exploring how the time series changes. Uh, and also you could change the initial value A and see how the time series changes. Okay, John, great. Let me put in the chat i'll put the code in the chat so that people people have it as i say all of the demos that we're going to use are going to be in the student materials folder but some of them are simple enough that it's easier just to cut and paste it from the from the simulation Does anybody need more time? People caught up with that. I realize that for some people, great. No, thank you. Okay. So one of the things we could do is to change the values of K1 and K2 and A. And uh, the code here is what I gave you here. Um, now we want to try doing a parameter scan. And I think I asked you already in, in uh, the first homework to try doing a parameter scan. Uh, the goal of that question was to, to get people to try to read the manuals and see what they could come up with. And if it worked, great. And if not, we cover it in class. So um, 
one of the key things that we need to know about antimony is that there is this slightly complicated structure, which is the string that we've loaded is a model specification. It's not a program. When we do a TE load A, we are loading that string and parsing it and converting it into something executable. Okay. The variables and parameters in that string are then turned into Python objects that are attributes of the simulation we loaded. So we create a simulation handle R here. Uh, we don't have to call it R. We could call it simulation if we wanted, um, which is the executable version of that string. R dot A will be the value of A. R dot K1 will be the value of K1. R dot K2 will be the value of K2. Those can be read and written just the way we would read and write any Python variable. The key thing is that once we have loaded the model, there's no further reference to those initial values that are specified in the model string. And so if I overwrite the value of A, then that's what I have. It doesn't reset things back to 0, 0.0 the way it is in the in the in the model string. And so why don't people try doing that um, here after line one in that eight block? If I do R dot A equals my initial value of A was three, let's try my R dot A equals 10. What happens? Now my initial value is 10. Okay. And so now this gives me the option of changing the values because if I loop and change the value of A, each time I rerun, I'll have a different value of A. Here I can make a zero point zero one. Make start with a very small value of a. Now it's increasing to its equal its steady state. Okay. Does that make sense to people? Again, if if this is confusing, please don't be shy. If somebody's confused, one person's confused, other people are probably confused as well. Okay. Now, something that is important to know is that the simulate function continues from the values that were left at the end of the previous simulation. And so if I do r.simulate 0 to 10, well, by 10, I'm already done. So why don't I just simulate from 0 to 1? I'm starting out. Now let me run this again. I don't want to overwrite A this time. I don't want the T load A either. I want r.simulate. I'm going to simulate again. And I'll plot again. It may be hard to see, but if you look here, you'll notice on the x-axis, say the y-axis, the values are different. So this is the values from time zero to time one. The x-axis is labeled zero to one, but it's actually now simulating from one to two. If I wrote this here, one comma two, it might be clear. And so simulate take continues from wherever things left off before. That's very convenient because you can run the simulation for a short amount of time, see what happens, and then continue it. You don't have to start it over again. Okay. So this is what happens. Now I have a question. When you, when 
I mean, of course, you you load your model string. So and then I see that you later on use the object uh, from the object a the variable that you set it differently. But you could as well change your model string because you have any way to load it, right? So I mean, when you know how to modify a string with the formatting the string, then you could as well just change the string. Right. The whole point of this is to not have to do that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's the, about, it's okay. I mean, it's a nice way to do it, but in my opinion, it buys not much, but maybe I'm wrong. Or at the moment, I don't see that this helps a lot. Maybe when the model it, becomes it, more complicated. It, it makes a huge difference. Okay. Okay. You have to go yeah. in and start editing the model string. It's a nightmare. The point is that once the model is loaded, you have access to all of the variables and parameters in the model. Mm -hmm. So you don't you don't reload the model. Now, the problem with this is the opposite, which is suppose that I want to go back where I started. In other words, suppose I'm now simulated for time step two time steps, and now I want to go back and start the model over again. To reset time, to restore the model, I have two choices. I can either load the model again. I can do a te.load a a second time, which will basically restore the values that are in the string. Or I'm going to use the resets. Oh, and, this is, and the resets are something that we have to learn. Uh, we're typically not going to use a lot of them. There are a bunch of them for different purposes. Um, R.reset changes the variables back to their initial values. R.reset all resets the variables and the parameters back to their initial values. Reset to origin resets everything in the model. And in the models that we have, there isn't anything else. So there's no difference between reset all and reset to origin. But if you write very complicated models, Andamoni has other things that have can be reset that we haven't talked about yet. Okay. Now you could say, what's the difference between a floating species or a variable and a parameter? Uh, a parameter is something like K1 or K2, which is used to define a rate, but is not changed by a chemical reaction. There's no differential equation that describes how K1 changes or K2 changes. It's not changed in the simulation. Uh, A is changed in the simulation. It's a variable. There doesn't seem to be a way to reset the parameters without resetting the variables. And so when we're doing parameter scans, we'll often be using the reset functions to do that. Uh, why wouldn't you want to just use load A all the time? Well, the reason is that in this case, it doesn't matter. But loading a model is slow because you're running a parser. And if you have a very long, complicated model and you're doing the say inside an optimization loop where it's being run millions of times, uh, loading the model a million times uh, slows things down a lot, whereas reset is very fast. And so basically it's, a, it's, a, it's an optimization issue why you don't want to do load rather than reset. Okay. And so we can try this here. Let me do here before r.simulate, I'm going to do r.reset. Try this yourself, if you would. And I better type it properly. And now it does matter that it was zero comma two. So and let's see what happened. I reset. This is not what I was expecting, actually. Let me see what happened. I ran simulate from zero to one. 
And now I reset it and I simulate and the value is now going down. Why is that? Let's see, if I use reset all, what happens? If I use reset all, it will reset the, ah, okay. So reset actually, ha. Huh? look what I did. I set the value of A to be 0 0.1 here. What does reset do? Reset reads the value of A I defined in the string, which was three. And so here it's starting at three. So it is in fact doing what I asked it to do. So why don't you play with that a little bit? You can change the value of A you change here and use reset versus reset all. You could try changing the value of K1 or K2 and see what that does. So just spend a minute or two playing with that. Sorry, what's I'm... the difference? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, what's the difference between resetting it to its initial value versus the value when the model was loaded? Aren't they the same? Yes. So so the difference is, I mean, the, the difference here is reset will only reset the value of A in this case. If I change the value of K1 and K2, reset all would also reset the value of K1 and K2. So suppose that here, instead of Ka, this were K1. Then what's the difference between reset and reset to origin? Okay, so reset to origin resets other things which we're not using at the moment. Okay. So there, as I mentioned, in Ad, one of the nice things about added money is the syntax is very simple. Um, you really only need to know about the things that we've seen to do a lot of the modeling that we're going to be doing. But Anemone has quite a few elaborate features. And some of those uh, have states which can be reset, which are, are not included in reset all. So that's what that's about. Uh, I'm putting that in for completeness. We're not using it at the moment. Okay, got it. So my question was, could you once again repeat what floating species are? I didn't catch that. Variables. I'm using Herbert's terminology, which is floating species. A is a floating species or a variable. So when well, K is a variable too, right? No, K is the parameter. Oh, uh, there is distinguishing. Okay, thank you. So you could make k a variable. If I wrote an equation for k, then it would be a variable, but it's a parameter because it is not k does not occur inside of a reaction. It's not, excuse me, it occurs inside of a reaction as, as a rate, a rate constant, but it's not changed by a reaction. Okay. So I, have a, okay. I have a question, actually. Sure, Don, go ahead. So when you start to develop these more complex models, I mean, my first instinct is to put a ton of comments, especially on resets. Do you have a better way of documenting your resets throughout a, a long or a complex model? So absolutely, if I were going to be developing a model uh, seriously, I would comment everything. I would comment the initial values. I would comment the rate constants. I would comment the purpose of the model. I would comment what I'm trying to do with each line. And so I agree with you as programming practice, that's true. Uh, if I'm going to code on the fly in front of everybody, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to leave out the comments because it takes a long time to type them. Uh, but, but you're absolutely right that we should be explaining what we're doing when we type it. And in the homeworks, I'd appreciate it if people would explain what they're doing. Uh, 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 in general, there's, there's some tension in the sense that Coding on the fly in front of you, I don't, sometimes that works for people. Some people like it when I code in front of them. Some people like to code on their own. Um, people have different tastes. So so some years I would just show you this, the, the figure here on the, the, the slide on the left and say, you do it. And then half the people in the room will say, we want to see you do it too. And some years I'll do it like this. And then half the people will come back and say, we'd rather do it on our own. It's a matter of taste how, how people learn, I think. But yes, absolutely. 
uh, when you're going to, if you're going to publish a model, you should have comments explaining what you're doing at each step. I think actually, I don't know about John's question might be how to comment in the model string and it's like in C, so you have these double slashes. If this was your question, because it's not obvious how to comment in a string, right? Right, and they also added the Python comment. So hash also works as a comment character inside the model string. So, so both the Python and the C comment syntax work. So if I want to put in a comment here, this is the initial value of A. That'll work. Right? So. So we did this one already. And now we could run a simulation where we change the value of K1 or change the value of A, reset and run multiple times. And we could play with what reset does versus reset all. And again, for the purposes of today, I don't want to take too much time on this. There's a lot one can explore. But again, reset will set the value of A back to its initial value, but not K1 if we changed it. Reset all will set both A and K back to their initial values. Okay. So now we want to do a little parameter scan. And uh, I think everybody's used at least a little Python. So we're going to use a loop. Um, one of the things that's an annoyance in Python is that they don't have loops as uh, they don't have numerical loops as a built in. So you have to, and they're not even in Python. You know, they're only in NumPy. It baffles me sometimes with C. It was the same thing. Why are, why are, why are, math, why are functions like sine and cosine not loaded in C by default? Somebody had a, had a had a had a point to make a, a philosophical point to make when they designed these languages. So one of the things we're going to use a lot, and in fact that you use it so much that I would always recommend having it, is we're going to use NumPy. And I will just um, always say put import NumPy as NP. And in fact now in CompuCell, the NumPy is always imported as. Uh, that's true. Elmer says you don't need sine and cosine to write an operating system. Fair enough. If you want to do any calculation, you sort of should have mathematics, basic algebra. Okay, so we'll import NumPy as NP. And the reason we want to do that is we want to be able to do it iterators. And something that uh, is a very Pythonic concept is that for loops in Python iterate over lists. And so uh, that may seem trivial, but it actually has some reasonably profound consequences when you do things like slicing. And so why don't people try actually running this little simulation here? Um, we're going to, why did we load NumPy? We want to be able to have a change value continually. And we don't have the option of iterating over over uh, floats uh, in, num in in base Python. You have to use NumPy for it. NumPy a range is the command. And you ask where did how do you remember the commands in NumPy? The answer is I don't. I'm, I put my nose in the NumPy manual online. These days I might go to Chat GPT and ask it to generate the code for me. I bet if you add if you put in any of these examples homework examples in chat GPT, it'll give you code. Uh, probably code that works, actually. Uh, it does know to lure in. But let's try this out. Um, I'm going to just type here for a zero in NumPy a range 0, 0.0, comma, 
4.0 comma 0 0.5 colon. Now we'll do a reset. And now we'll do an R dot simulate. And then we'll do a plot. And I said to two. And let's see what we get. Oops. Oh, because I needed to reload this. Now, one thing that you'll face with Jupyter Notebooks, depending on what IDE you're using, if you use Jupyter Notebooks versus uh, Spider versus the command line, the default when you do multiple plots, whether they're overlaid or in separate in separate windows, is is different. And there's some settings you can uh, change uh, to do whether you do overlays or not. But were people able to get that to work? Would people like me to give you the, the little iterator code here? As I say, it evaluates it, but it puts everything in a separate window, which is not very convenient. Um, you can you can control that in the IDE, but then what you do depends on how the person has their IDE configured, which isn't the greatest. And so there is a command that's uh, useful to remember is instead of using r dot plot, which plots whatever the last output of the simulation is, um, there is a plot array function, te dot plot array. And so that will essentially do the same thing, but uh, give you a little bit more control. Still giving me different plots. In fact, it's done the same thing. Um, if people like NumPy, uh, let me say NumPy, Matplotlib, you're welcome to just use Matplotlib from the beginning. Uh, both plot and plot array are, are matplotlib uh, derived. So uh, plot array doesn't seem to do much for us. But there is a command now show equals false. And that forces the, the plots to lie on top of each other. And so... Now, when I do my plot, I'll do show equals false. And we have to remember logicals in Python. Uh, uh, false and true with a capital first letter. And why doesn't it do anything? Why doesn't it display anything? Well, so show the last it. one you have to show the last one you have to show right yeah now here we don't know which the last one is so the easiest thing to do here would just be to repeat this line outside of the outside of the loop with show equals true or just nothing the default is true Why am I getting just one line? What did I leave out of my code? The code on the screen and the code that I typed are not the same. What did I leave out? You're not assigning a not. Perfect, yes. I forgot to reset my value of a. So why doesn't everybody try that? Make sure that that works for people. Pedro makes a comment that in the manual, they don't show how this way of doing parameter scans. There are a lot of different ways to do parameter scans. 
Uh, some of them are very elaborate, some of them are very simple, some of them are very pythonic, some are very elegant, some are very procedural. This is a rather procedural way to do parameter scans. Uh, so it's maybe not the most pythonic uh, way of doing it. But I'm a big believer in simplicity, at least to start out with. Another thing that I, I noticed is I had reset the value of K1 to be 0 0.01, which is why the display looks a little bit different from what um, from what's in the uh, on the slide. I'll redo that with the, and I'll make that the last time five. So we get exactly what we have on the screen. I mean, again, one can build very elaborate plots. You can use matplotlib to do 3D plots. You can do uh, labels. You can do many, many things. Uh, but today, we're just doing the very basics. Elmer says, OK. Okay, great. Okay, one thing you might want is to have the colors be different for the different lines. Uh, there's a not particularly beautiful um, command, which is called reset color cycle equals false. That means that each time it goes through, it gets a different color. So you set reset color cycle equals false. And now I get different colors. If I want to have a key, notice that the R dot plot gave me a key for the values. Uh, if I want to have a key using plot array, I have to build it. And um, plot array takes a, a slightly it, it builds a list of the labels as it's iterated with plot with show equals false. And the label itself has to be in square brackets uh, and it has to be a string. And so this is more just decoration than anything else. But if I want to have a label, which is the value of a naught, I can type labels equals square bracket and now i need a string a naught equals quote plus string of a naught That syntax right I have matching prints. So, okay. And that'll give me the key. And I certainly wouldn't expect people to remember that. That's one you have to look up in in, uh, in the manuals. On the other hand, once you have a demo of it once, you can always use that. I'd recommend saving this because you can use this and make changes to it and build it up. Try running that. If anybody is having problems or have any questions, um, please ask. If this, if you've gotten through all of this much faster than everyone else, that's fine. Uh, there's plenty that you can explore. You could try doing two parameters at once. You could try changing the parameter values rather than the ver and then the initial value. Try using reset all rather than reset lots of things that you could do. you could try try making it a logarithmic plot 
instead of a linear plot. Lots of options. So let's keep going here. Start taking these simple, simple things that we've been developing and we gradually make them a little bit more complex. But really, for the most part, we're not going to be doing things that are that much more complicated than this. The, the, the one time things get a little bit more complicated is when we're going to use optimizers, the SciPy optimizers to, to do parameter fitting. Okay. So I think I think we can skip this a little bit. Uh, these would just be changing parameter values instead of variables. Same, same kind of thing. Okay. So um, one thing that we want to come back to a little bit uh, is that when I said that it was mechanical to to uh, take a chemical reaction and write the ODEs from it, we have to be a little bit careful uh, if we have a reaction like 2A goes to B. Um, and that's because we use up two molecules of A uh, to produce each molecule of B. And that means there's a factor of two that we have to put in our ODEs. And Herbert will go goes into a, a, a fair amount of terminology about uh, stoichiometric coefficients, which are basically those numbers. And the spe species stoichiometric coefficient is the difference between the number of molecules that are used up on the left hand side, the number that are produced on the right hand side. Now, you might say, well, why why were there be the same molecule on both sides of a chemical reaction. Well, a lot of times there, there aren't, in which case you don't have to worry about it. But but it's pretty common in biology to have, say, three molecules of ATP used and get one molecule back. And so it's not unusual to have the same species show up on both sides of the chemical reaction. And when you do mass action rate laws, you discover that the, that the results are different. Are different. When you if you cancel out those those things that seem to be superfluous, you actually get different results. So just uh, to belabor the obvious, if I have two A's go to B, the stoichiometric coefficient of A is minus two. I use up two A's. I don't get any back on the right. So the stoichiometric coefficient is minus two. So the reactants have negative stoichiometric coefficients. The products have positive stoichiometric coefficients. If I have 2A plus B goes to A plus C, then the stoichiometric coefficient would be minus 2 plus 1, minus 1 for A, minus 1 for B, and plus 1 for C. Those rates that I wrote on the arrow, when I convert them into ODEs, I have to multiply by that stoichiometric coefficient. And so maybe that this is a little bit excessive to do this. But suppose that I have a times a, a little a times a going to little a sub s going to a of, let me say that again. I have little a sub s molecules of a on the left, and I wind up with little a sub p substrate and product molecules of a on the right. The stoichiometric coefficient would be a sub p minus a sub c. The net rate of change would be CA, that is AP minus AC, times the velocity of the reaction. William, question. Wait, where is AC? Or maybe I'm just overthinking this. Uh, this a CA here is the difference between AP and AC. I know, but what is a AC? 
AC is just the net stoichiometric coefficient. Okay. Uh, you can ignore a C A here and just look at AP minus AS if you like. But the key thing is that I want the velocity on the arrow to be independent of the numbers of the, the different products. And so I write one rate on top of the arrow. And then when I make my ODEs, I have to put multiply by the appropriate factors to make things work out. It's actually easier in practice than it seems to be when I write it out like this. I think. So again, if I have a reaction, A sub S times A of A plus B sub S times time of B goes to A sub P of A plus B sub P of B, at a rate v, dA by dt is AP minus AS times v, dB by dt is equal to BP minus BS times v, and so on. Again, to me, this seems belaboring, or I mean, we're doing arithmetic, but but uh, it's, it's, it's sometimes surprisingly easy to get confused about where those constants go. So, for example, if I have 4A plus B going to 2A plus 3B plus C, dA by dt is 2 minus 4 times V minus 2V. dB by dt, I have nothing written here. That's 1 minus 1 plus 3, 2V. dC by dt, nothing on the left, plus 1 on the right, V. And so you notice V, V, and V, but multiplied by minus 2, 2, and 1. And so this is sort of maybe an excessive workflow. If I have a bunch of chemical reactions, and they have rate V1, V2, and so on, what do I do? I look at the first chemical species, A. I look at the value on the left, the value on the right. Take the difference between them and multiply by V1. If I have a second chemical reaction with the A on both sides, I take the value on the left minus the value on the right and multiply by V2. And I add them because if A is being affected in reaction one and in reaction two, the net change of A is the sum of the rates for the change for either one independently. All right. And that's it. So dA by dt would be CA, that is AP1 minus AS1 times V1 plus AP2 minus AS1 times V2 and so on. That should be a two, not a one. That's a typo. They just do that systematically for each reaction. And so I don't know. Do, is that clear enough or do people want to try to do one example as an exercise? The first one is maybe too complicated. The second one has two rates. Why don't people just try number two, the first line of number two? So just look at the second, this first line of number two, A plus two B goes to A plus C at a rate V1 and write out the ODEs for A, B, and C. Just take a minute to do that. Just check that you've, that you've figured out how that works. And I picked that one because there's a little bit of a trick in that one.
Does somebody want to give me the answer? What is dA by dt for this line? I zero. got zero. Zero. It bring him. Yes, it's zero. Because I destroy an A and I create an A. So I don't change my amount of A. For B, it's minus two times V1. For C, it's plus V1. And so you can you can play with that. Okay. Now this is always assuming we know what these rates are, what these V rates are. In reality, those rates are going to depend on a lot of things. Some of those things are in the inside of our model, like our case and our concentrations. Some of those things are outside of our model, like the temperature, the pH, the pressure, and so on. Um, Mathematically, we want to know how we determine what the rate law is for chemical reaction. And, of course, in general, the answer is you have to find out. You have to do an experiment to find that out. But there are some rules of thumb. And the main rule of thumb is that if we have some complicated chemical reaction like this, and this is just pulled out of the air, um, and we don't have any other information at all. The key question is, are there intermediate reactions or not? In fact, a reaction this complicated almost certainly would have intermediates, but we're going to assume there aren't. And if we have simple chemical reactions, our zeroth order assumption will be that the chemical reaction laws obey mass action, the rate laws obey mass action. And that means that at least for low concentrations of our chemicals, the rate of reaction is proportional to the product of the molar concentration of each reactant raised to a power. And that power is precisely that stoichiometric number here. And that's why 9A goes to 2A is not the same as 7A goes to nothing, because the rate will be different. In one case, I'd have A to the ninth. In the other case, I'd have A to the seventh. Very different chemical reaction rate. So you can't net out the, the values on both sides of a reaction. And again, a mass action is completely mechanical. If I have 9A plus 16B plus 4C plus G, the reaction rate is some constant. The rate constant times a to the ninth times b to the sixteenth times c to the fourth times g. Now, in reality, these rate constants are hard to measure in experiment, so that's a problem. But but that's an experimental problem. The Appendix at the end of this lecture gives a detailed explanation of why mass action works. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details today, but let's think about uh, a very simple case. If two molecules are going to react with each other, they have to come in contact. And suppose that the concentrations of my molecules are low and the molecules are moving randomly in space, then the probability of a reaction is going to depend on the probability that two molecules of the right kind are close together. Now, that's not enough. They don't just have to be close together. They have to be spatially oriented right with a relationship to each other. And exactly how close they have to be is also a bit of a vexed question. But what we're going to be considering here is just the scaling, how does, if we say that they have to be within some volume of each other, how does that probability depend on the concentration? Well, suppose that I have something very simple. The reaction is A goes to B. I need one molecule of A. Well, the probability that I have one molecule of A in a volume is just the density of A, 
which means V of A is linear in A, in the concentration of A. Now it's called first order kinetics, A to the one. Suppose that I have to have two molecules of A to react. Well, the probability that two molecules of A are within a given volume is A squared, where A is the concentration. And so in that case, the rate of reaction is v k times A squared. If I need two molecules of A and three of B, then my rate is A times A times C times C times C. And that's how it goes forward. And there's a typo here. V A, this should be V of A comma C is equal to K times A squared times C cubed. Now, one thing that is clearly wrong here is that if the concentrations of my molecular species get to be very high, the rates of reaction go to infinity. And that's never true biologically. And so as the concentrations go up, the rate of reaction is actually lower than what's predicted by mass action. That's why I said that mass action only applies if the concentrations are low. How low depends essentially on the size of the molecules, the volume fraction of the molecules. What about decay? Well, if a molecule breaks down independently, spontaneously, then the rate of, of decay of each molecule is independent of everything else. It's like radioactive decay, in which case the decay rate is just proportional to the k times the concept, the rate of decay of an individual molecule times the concentration. So that's a first order decay kinetics. Even when the synthesis of molecules is very elaborate, uh, the decay of molecules is almost always first order kinetics. Uh, the only time that's not going to be true is when you have something where you have assisted decay breakdown, uh, things like ubiquitination. And even then, the rate of decay of the molecule, the K, the, the K value will change, but the proportionality won't change because molecules decay, decay independently of each other. The only time that wouldn't be true is if the molecules have to hybridize to decay. That's not that it never happens, but it's not very frequent. We've talked about sources and constant rates. Um, nothing goes to S. Nothing goes to S at a constant rate, K. Um, a lot of times the symbol, and, and Adam only uses this, for uh, a fixed concentration. Normally, if I wrote A goes to S, that would mean A is used up. If I have an unlimited source of A that is providing S, I put a dollar sign in front of the A. And that means that even though A is showing up on the left-hand side, its value doesn't change. I basically imagine I have an infinite reservoir of A. This is called zeroth order kinetics because the rate is independent of the concentration. Okay. Now, this was a bit of a homework problem, which is now we can start building a slightly more complicated reactions. Um, and let's think about a chemical reaction where we have three molecules of A going to two of B. Just that we can write immediately using mass action, the forward rate, if we have three molecules of A, the forward rate is k forward times a cubed. If we have two molecules of b going to three of a, the backward rate is kr times b squared. So again, the, the stoichiometric coefficient goes into the exponent in the rate. That's what mass action does. The thing that we have to be a little bit careful about is the arrows for sources and for decay. Um, the, this hybrid diagram that I've written here 
nothing goes nothing goes to 3a 3a goes to 3b 2b 2b goes to nothing is really a shorthand for nothing goes to a and b goes to nothing and so you don't have b squared in the rate for decay and you don't have the aq of the 3a uh, in the rate for the creation and so when you write the ODEs for this, dA by dt is k1, not three times k1. And dB by dt is minus k2b, not two minus two kbt. Sorry, two k two k two b. And so um, this is something that can be a bit confusing. The homework problem addressed this. Um, and I don't know what to tell you, except that that's how people write it. Sometimes the sometimes the notation that people use is, is the ambiguous. And so the, all I can suggest is that we practice it together. Okay. So if I start with the core of this, this is well behaved. 3A goes to 2B. That means I have a k forward times a cubed and that's going to be multiplied in the da by dt by three because i use up three a's for each reaction db by dt i get two b's for each reaction so i get two kf a cubed So for the core, that's fine. The backward reaction, I use up two Bs to make three As, and that rate is Kr times B squared from mass action. And so I get three times Kr B squared, the backward rate here, and I use up two Kr B squared, the backward rate here. So this is all consistent. The thing that's not consistent from this diagram at the beginning is that the production of A, you would expect to be three times K1, but it's not, it's just K1. And the decay, K2B, you'd expect it to be two times K2B, but it's just K2B. And so that's something you have to get used to. Okay. Uh, mass action caveats. Um, the linear dependence of occupancy on concentration only is the case if the volume of the molecules is small compared to the space they occupy. If, if anybody has ever done the virial coefficients in chemistry, which are pretty ugly, those are the correction factors for, for mass action. And they're pretty, it's not something that, I mean, the, 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 uh, any chemistry to any biochemistry, or even regular chemistry textbook, uh, will do the derivation of the real coefficients, but they're pretty ugly. You don't want to be doing them here. Uh, the one thing that we need to know is that in general, at high concentrations, the probability of simultaneous occupancy increases slower than you'd expect for mass action. And so the actual rates of chemical reaction are usually going to be slower than mass action predict. Now, it's possible that other things happened. Um, in biology, chemical reactions are not happening in water. Cells are very crowded. They have cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is full of molecular species. And so um, the presence of all these other molecules can lead to uh, either reduced probabilities of interaction or, or enhanced probabilities of interaction, depending on the size of the molecules. Um, it's also possible that, for example, if the molecules are charged or polar, they can attract each other over some distance, and that can increase the rate of reaction compared to mass action. And again, if you want to go through all the details, Phillips, the physical biology of the cell, 
does uh, depletion forces and all of the things that need to be considered here. In this course, we're not going to do, do the derivations of that. So let's just come back and do this again. We have a chemical reaction, A times... Oh, a units of A plus B units of B go to P units of P plus Q units of Q at a rate V. Mass action is V is K times A to the little a times B to the little b and so on. One thing that you have to be a little bit cautious about is that the rate constant K has different units depending on how many A, B, and C are involved which feels very unnatural. You'd want, you'd, the natural thing would be for K to just be per time. But in fact, K has units of uh, per time times uh, per concentration. And the concentration is raised to a different power depending on the form. That means, for example, that you can't add Ks for different reactions. It doesn't make sense. But again, there's a there's a straightforward workflow for doing this. If I see AS times A plus BS times B, and the rate is V, AS times A gives a rate A to the AS. BS times B gives a rate B times B to the BS, and so on. And then everything is multiplied by the rate constant K. If reactions are reversible, then the two reactions are treated separately. I do the rate forward rate, write everything out. I do the backward rate, write everything out, and then I add them up. So I basically, if I see 2A plus B goes to C plus D reversibly, I say 2A plus B goes to C plus D irreversibly, and C plus D goes to 2A plus B reversibly. So I break down this more complicated reaction into two simpler reactions. So for example, 2A plus B goes to C, V forward will be K forward times A squared from the two times B. Backward, C plus D times VR, K reverse times C times D. So the net rate of reaction would be Kf A squared times B minus Kr times C times D. I realize that I'm going through this pretty fast, but this is, pure, again, purely mechanical. If you see a number 2 times A, you know there's an exponent of 2 in the rate. If it's forward, you write the forward one, and you subtract the back one. So you do them independently. So you do things one at a time. Okay. And I don't think we need to go into a lot of detail here. Uh, we could do these, these out. I think we had a homework problem for this. We'll have a homework problem for this. One thing that you have to be a little bit cautious about um, in uh, in notation is again people are often inconsistent with notation and if you see something written like this 2a plus b goes to c plus d with a lowercase k on top of it that means assume that the rate is mass action it's not that the rate is a constant k the rate is actually k times a squared times b. And people have written a shorthand. And they really shouldn't write that shorthand. It's very confusing to see that shorthand. Uh, but it's pretty common. So you have to get used to it. If you ever see, uh, except for a source term, if you ever see a lowercase k on an arrow with no, with no concentration multiplying it, that means you have to guess that they're assuming mass action kinetics. All right.
Now I want to talk a little bit about chemical equilibrium. We talked about steady state, and I mentioned the steady state and chemical equilibrium aren't the same. So let's suppose that I have a chemical reaction. A goes to B, and B goes to A. We'll assume mass action. So the forward rate is Kf times A. The backward rate is Kr times B. If I run this, no matter what my initial values look like, I'll see B and A will reach steady states. Since there's no source of A or B, this is a closed reaction, A plus B is a constant. The final amounts of A and B depend on the initial amount. And this is what we mean by chemical equilibrium. If we have a steady state with no inputs or outputs to the system, that's a chemical equilibrium. I can ask the question, what are the values of B and A at equilibrium? I can solve that by setting the rates to zero. And I find that the ratio of B equilibrium to A equilibrium is K equilibrium. And that's given by K forward over K reverse. The bigger K forward is, the less A I'm going to get at equilibrium. The bigger K reverse is, the more A I'll get at equilibrium. In the case of mass action for a simple reaction like this, it's pretty straightforward. If I have more complicated reactions, 3A plus B goes to 5A plus C, then solving the equilibrium is a little bit more complicated. Notice that at any given time, A plus A equilibrium plus B equilibrium is the initial amount of A plus the initial amount of B. Mass is conserved. And so then I can solve the whole thing if I like. All right. I think, you know, actually, I think I'm a little bit ahead of where I want it to be today. Uh, I think this is enough. I don't think I want to go further. For, I, I don't think I want to drag you through a lot of algebra today. So I think last time we ran over by a little bit. So I'll give you back half an hour of your life. Uh, I guess before we let me let me stop, let me come back here. I'll stop I'll stop here. This is the homer pump. Are there any questions about what we've done so far? I realize that some of these arithmetic or algebraic manipulations may seem a little bit alien, uh, but they're really just doing arithmetic. And I, I also realize we did a little bit more arithmetic today and a little bit less coding. We did a little bit of coding. Does anybody have any comments or questions for today before we break? No. Okay, well, I hope that this helps you with the homework. Again, uh, the things that we've covered today are things that were in the homework that was due today because this was material I really was planning on covering last week. Um, so if you had trouble getting the homework in today, by all means, take the extra week and do it again. Submit it again. All right. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for coming back today. I'm sorry I couldn't come in in person. Um, and I look forward to working with everybody uh, going forward. Please do think about some projects. Um, please do think about some projects. I realize we haven't gotten very far, and so the projects may seem a bit alien. but you can look at the look at the, the biology or the mathematics of what you're doing and tell, see what's interesting to you. And by all means, feel free next week or or even before that to come back to me and ask about possible projects.